So I want to welcome you all here today, uh, joining us from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Nicole Neufeld, um, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator here at the Art Gallery of Guelph. And I'm thrilled that you're all joining us this evening for a conversation between artists Meg Ross and Jose Andres Mora. Uh, this conversation has been organized in concert with Meg Ross's exhibition, currently on view at the Art Gallery of Guelph, Nearest Neighbor, which marks the culmination of two years in the studio working towards a Master of Fine Arts uh, in Studio Arts at the University of Guelph. So to begin, uh, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement on behalf of the Art Gallery of Guelph, which is hosting this, uh, this discussion tonight. What we now call Guelph, Ontario is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people today. As we gather this evening, uh, we would like to acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Guelph uh, resides on the ancestral lands of the Attawandrum people, and more recently, the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize the significance of the Dish With One Spoon covenant to this land and offer our respect for Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we continue to, to strive to strengthen our relationships with them. And we express our deep gratitude and recognize our responsibility for the stewardship of this land on which we live, work, and create. And so as we're gathered here today, connected uh, virtually yet physically dispersed, it's, it's also a good moment to um, reflect and contemplate on the significance of place uh, and in doing so recognize how the different traditional lands uh, we reside in and move through inform our lives. Uh, for myself as a settler working uh, at a cultural institution, I recognize that this is a crucial statement and a, a moment uh, for pause and contemplation for us all to think about um, how especially organizations like ours uh, can remind us um, to be aware of the ongoing effects of colonialism that underpin our institutional histories. So not only have cultural institutions like ours employed deeply colonial methods of representation, but because of our authority that has been granted to us um, in the way that we shape histories, these narratives have been accepted as truth, informing policies and practices that have very real everyday implications. So again, it's, it's a good reminder and moment of pause uh, to think about the histories of, of this land and the people who, to, who live here. So for a few housekeeping notes, um, uh, I uh, just want to let you know that this, the speakers this evening are really excited to hear from you uh, and would love to hear your perspectives. So I do encourage you to drop any questions or comments in the chat and there will be, there will be time for us to um, interact with those along the way. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I'd like to share some bios uh, for our two speakers this evening. Uh, Meg Ross's practice blends installation, photography, photography, sculpture, and writing, focusing on the ambiguity of language through its poetic and physical qualities. Ross redefines, adapts, and translates roles of communication. Ross graduated from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University in 2015 with a BFA in Intermedia, and she exhibited a, um, a solo installation for Nuit Blanche in 2018 and has been featured in multiple group exhibitions at venues including Gallery 44, the Kyber Centre for the Arts, Eye Level Gallery, uh, Robert Kenanage Gallery, Boarding House Gallery, and the Cook House Gallery in London, England. Meg Ross is now officially an MFA graduate from the Studio, Art, Studio Arts Program at the University of Guelph. Jose Andreas Mora is a Venezuelan-born artist and settler living in Toronto. In his 10-year career, Mora completed the Studio Art Program at Capilano University in 2008. He earned a BFA in inter interdisciplinary arts from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in 2012 and finished 
the MFA in Studio Arts at the University of Guelph as well. Currently, Mora is the gallery manager at the Media Arts Artist Run Center, Trinity Square Video, and sits on the board of directors of the Media Arts online platform, uh, VacaVu. Vaca Mora has exhibited projects across Canada in venues like Art Metropole, Birch Contemporary, Dalhousie Art Gallery, Nuit Blanche, Struts Gallery, among many others. Most recently, Mora exhibited a solo show uh, called The Morning in Reverse in Art Space in um, Peterborough and produced the telephone based project Land Line Gallery for Trinity Square Video. And I'd like to welcome both uh, Meg and Jose Andreas uh, to, to join the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Oh my god, you're all frozen for a second there. Okay. Oh Thank no. You. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I can hear you. <laughs> right at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I am really honored to be here and to have this conversation with my colleague, uh, Meg Ross, about her work. Um, I'm Jose Andres, and I'm going to be uh, kind of moderating this talk, I guess. <laughs> um, a few months ago, uh, or weeks ago, I, I don't know, um, Meg invited me to participate in this artist's talk by uh, helping her carry out this conversation <clears throat> about her exhibition, and I was really excited and said, yes, absolutely. And then a few days later, I think I was like, wait, what am I doing? And she said, do whatever you want. And I was like, okay, great. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, but she also mentioned that she wanted me to talk about my work, which I thought was really generous. And so considering that this is an exhibition of her work, right? Um, and so we talked a little bit about how we were gonna do in this conversation talk around both of our practices and focusing on the parts that uh, overlap from our studio practices. So I'm an artist. Uh, and as an artist, I have questions and curiosities around Meg's work. And a lot of those questions come from the fact that we share a lot of similarities in our interests. And some of those reasons also, so, sorry, some of the questions that I have though are questions that I have just from the fact that I kind of want to know how she thinks as an artist. And so for that reason, um, we thought it would be kind of interesting to conduct our conversation, and I mean, by conversation, I mean this, this presentation, um, a little bit in the style that I would maybe carry out a studio visit with Meg. So I'm going to be asking Meg a few questions with some modifications, um, but I guess like this is sort of where I, I kind of wanted to feel like a studio visit that people get to peek into. <clears throat> <clears throat> because two visits are my favorite thing. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Amazing. So um, the only difference here is going to be, of course, that um, you all know Mike's work intimately and maybe you're not so familiar with mine. So um, I first going to begin by inviting Meg to do an introduction about her work and her exhibition for anyone in the audience that just needs to do a refresher of the exhibition. And, about the exhibition. And then I'm going to introduce a little bit about my work uh, for anyone wondering who is this person. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and then we'll get some questions started. And um, uh, throughout the conversation, I'm gonna be showing, I'm gonna be showing some images of Mike's work and also showing some images of my work and jumping back and forth and so on and so forth. And hopefully that makes sense to everyone. So. With all that said, I'm going to open up the, the floor. floor to Meg. Yes, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, Nicole, I am getting a notification that I, I have host disabled participant screen sharing. I will I, get that sorted for you right away. Thank you. I had to leave the conversation at one point and then come back in. So that's oh, why right. probably what happened. I am a co-host now, wonderful. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Away, right? Okay, well, thanks to Nicole and everyone at the Art Gallery um, for letting me speak today. And thanks to everyone for being here and for coming. Um, thank you also to Jose Andreas for participating in this talk and being so extremely generous with your time. I've been a fan of your work for a while now, so I'm thrilled to have this conversation with you. Um, so preparing for this talk has been a really wonderful opportunity for me to delve more deeply into my thesis work that I created for my MFA. It kind of felt like a compliment, like a, like a nice little walk in the park through work that I know really well, but still found some exciting ideas along the way. So like we kind of mentioned already, my goal for this discussion is to talk about for about 10 minutes to um, introduce some aspects of my work and give a little verbal tour of what you would see uh, walking into the space. So I'm gonna zero in on what the work means to me and, and um, kind of where and how I situate it in contemporary art. So my work mostly takes the form of photo-based sculptural environments that use a variety of materials, but in this work presented at the Art Gallery of Guelph. I use glass, photo papers, um, MDF and aluminum. How I understand the language of photography is uh, far from straightforward and I'm more interested in its relationship between materiality, immateriality and dematerialization. The technique that I use used to explore this was embodying the logic of disillusion through the process of searching through my photographic archive <clears throat> and pinpointing moments of error, one sec, um, such as scratch emulsions, light leaks, and chemistry failures in my digitalized film negatives. I situated the, I, like, the general idea of this work in relation to the concept of affect defined by Gregory Segworth and Melissa Gregg as, quote, the intimate and impersonal that accumulates across both relatedness and interruptions in relatedness. Our relationship with images is often filters from, filtered from fingers to screens, and it's through that tension that I'm really interested in bringing photography back to the material. An image is a copy, a replicated visual circulating and being dispersed through a variety of hosts. The circulatory logic of the image saturated world we live in today to be exact, it's 54,400 photographs are produced every single second, makes me conclude that, takes, that taking a photograph today is almost a subconscious act. It's like a romantic attachment to fulfill an impulse capturing moments that theoretically last forever. By exploring conversations about where photography is now in the present day and how a contemporary approach to um, expand the uses of the image can lead us to a hybrid language that blends photography with writing, sculpture and installation. So when visitors enter the gallery, they will first see a table with photo books sitting on top. These books are made from photographs that are dry mounted onto MDF wooden blocks. The table as well as the photo books um, function like an index of the larger installation. Each book I created was a representation of the specific books that I read for my research for my thesis exhibition. And I welcome the viewers to interact with the books on the table and invite a, a lag time where intervals of contemplation and reflection um, can be present. And this notion of contemplation and reflection kind of spills into the larger space of the gallery where viewers are confronted with large scale abstract photographs that are mounted to um, supreme flatness, which not only feel atmospheric and calming, but also kind of deceptive since the work doesn't read as photographs from the start. The images have no edges, no lines, no shapes, and therefore it, it kind of invites multiple different interpretations when confronted with the atmospheric gradients. One person situated the images as fields, fields of color, fields of contemplation, um, others situated the work as paintings. So one could maybe think of it as, you know, or situate it in the interrelationship to digital and material culture of photographs. 
or someone could like depict the work in akin to accidental photographs taken by a mobile phone with her blown out pixels from the overabundance of light from a flash. And I think this resistance of classification is really um, of interest of mine. It's one of the reasons why situating it in affect made sense since affect is extremely random and fleeting. Affect in this environment allows us to consider the flexibility and fluidity of photography and strip it down just to focus on the light that is bathed in the space, a light and energy that feels um, alien and strange at the same time relaxing and calming, something like witnessing a sunset or a sunrise. The decision to recycle my images came from the logistics of shooting in analog during the pandemic, where um, camera stores and film services were closed for development. So getting film developed was kind of out of the question. Um, but working with my archive, I discovered, was an extraordinary source of visual material and inspiration. I have this belief that a photograph um, contains a multitude of images and that revisiting a photograph um, unfolds into other images of memory. Taking the smallest detail of, of images in my archive, for example, retained a certain uh, residue for me for something to revisit, to remember, to ponder, and to continue. It casted a critical view on light and perception, and I started to get excited about addressing and complicating this idea of an expanded image. And I asked myself, um, how do these image gather meaning? And in this context, working in a series that questions photography's materiality, affect was triggered by the shifting moods of this hybrid installation. It was one of the ways, it was a way for me to kind of connect with the loss of an image and explore questions of language and impermanence. So as our eyes move across the flat photographs on the wall, you move through the room, trying out different viewpoints, searching for clues and connections. This gets interfered with by the shimmering lines of the glass sculptures in the center of the room. So here you have a, a floor, floor sculptures. So if we can go to the maybe an image of the, the sculptures on the floor. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, that, that would work, perfect. Um, so here the floor sculptures are playing with the title of the, of the exhibition nearest neighbor. The term um, neighbor of course implies two of something, but these floor sculptures also function as a subtle suggestion to the tool that I use to create the photographs on the wall. It's like a sculptural rendering of a two-dimensional GIF in Photoshop named the Marquee Tool, also known as the Marching Ants. Um, but like the contingent nature of digital imagery, the shimmer of this line is way more than its function. It alters your perception, your path in the space, your body language. Um, in the book, The Neutral, Roland Barthes writes, the inventory of shimmers is of nuances of states of changes. The shimmer described here is metaphorically materialized in this line of glass beads that pools neatly onto the glass photographs on the, on the floor. The process of um, titling these works on the floor, as well as on the walls, followed a conceptual parameter of using micro the Microsoft Word alt text generator to produce the titles. From the outset, image and text have run parallel with each other, each on their own path, but staying close. There's a disconnect for better or for worse when one tries to describe an image um, through words and vice versa, even more so when we leave it up to the fates of automatic generators and algorithms. For example, this alt word gen engine in Microsoft is a generator with essentially one goal, and that's to recognize an image and use um, key, key words to describe that image in written language. However, it's very rudimentary in its descriptions. I find it kind of humorous, the, the way that it kind of uses language to describe these abstract photos. But I also give them credit too, since I can't really describe what the images look like myself. So by turning to alt generators, the result can be, um, like I said, humorous, but 
but also dangerous at the same time, as the description is often inaccurate of what the viewer is seeing. To give some examples um, of titles, the uh, background pattern description automatically generated with medium confidence. No image description automatically generated with high confidence. A picture containing outdoor sunset description automatically generated with low confidence. Content marked as descriptive will not expose a description to screen readers. I suspect that the generator situates itself through observing tonal ranges and space. I say this because it read the one that had more intensity at the bottom edge than the top edge as a sunset. However, to that logic, many of the other photographs should have been labeled a sunset as well, but they were just merely a background pattern. This makes me think that algorithms have personality traits that are not too dissimilar to human beings. Most have this kind of boundless drive, determination and persistence to do their job, but they can also be delusional, reckless and impulsive. Um, the algorithm that I use to create the images in the exhibition is called Nearest Neighbor. It's, it's one of the main like driving force for the reason I titled the show this, this title. Um, the algorithm's main job is to do, essentially to, to do a proximity search in a photograph. So it scans the image for pixel values and then optimizes the closest or most similar value to a given point. I was drawn to it because of its alliter alliteration, but also because of its personality. To me, nearest neighbor um, is like a reliable and dependable friend. It makes very generous decisions about what my photograph needs. I think it's fair and impartial. There's no judgment on photos, photographs when nearest neighbor does its job. I can't quite say the same about the alt text when it declares my photograph as no image. It's uh, impossible to reason with a personality like that. So I'm, I'm interested in things that are out of place and enlarging or extending the disarray and the dis disarranged title or tiny details. So it, it encompasses our field of view. The fragmentary nature of the works, for example, a glitch on the photograph, a sample of an image, the shimmer of, of the line of glass beads functions to me as a poem of loss and memory. However mortal or fleeting it is and how this poem becomes a foundation for our, our own synthesis of feeling and thinking with simple pleasures. It's about rethinking singularity and multiplicity and concepts of chance that reveal itself in poetic sentiment that are catalyzed by the accident, whether within the specific failings of technology the fragility of analog processes or just simply encounters with the mundane world of daily life. So I think right now I'll give the floor to Jose Andreas to introduce your work and then we can um, continue going back and forth. And like we said, we'll open up to some questions. Yeah, wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, that's really, that was really great to get a good sense of your work. I am just, uh, I stopped um, sharing my screen for a second just while I reset stuff on my end. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna be brief with my, uh, this group, with my um, sharing of, uh, of work. Yeah, um, I am, just gonna take a second here. Um, okay, wonderful. So like uh, next, I also went to NASCAR for my BFA and, and went to the University of Wales for my MFA, which is where I met Meg. Um, I have been working as an artist since 2012, uh, so for about 10 years, about 10 years now. And uh, my work uh, straddles a few different disciplines, uh, but I primarily would say that I'm an installation artist. Um, in my work, I'm interested in how I can use the material quality of certain types of technology and processes and also the material quality of certain objects to portray a, and also hopefully embody in the viewer, uh, an experience of displacement. <clears throat> 
the work that um, it's playing here is a uh, documentation of my work, um, Scanner, uh, Trinity Square Video. That was my graduation show. Um, and I'll, it'll make a little bit more sense uh, as I talk more about my work. So this general theme of uh, displacement uh, has goes way back for me. In 2012, uh, one of my earliest video works was a video recording of um, many friends of mine talking in different living rooms, uh, where in the video, I dubbed my voice over the voice of my friends, saying the exact same words that they were saying. And just to kind of give you a little bit of a sense, I'm going to play you just like a quick 15 second excerpt of just so you get So when it comes to critiquing things, if, if, if something is too far out there, they just like, they think it's like the worst thing in the world or like they, they can't verbalize. Okay, well, I'll give you a prime example and I actually understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so this, we did this conceptual piece about or we did all we all did conceptual pieces and this one girl this concept, conceptual piece on so just i'm just gonna find you a quick other excerpt just to get the sense of the effect um so there's a very close lip syncing there between our dubbing of my voice over the, my friend's voice and this particular exercise came from a very exploring a very type of vocal exercise i used to do uh, as a teenager um, where I tried really hard to get rid of my accent as a Venezuelan speaking English. And so I used to do this kind of imitation of other people's pronunciations to like try to erase uh, myself, I guess. And also, um, and, and, plus, and since I did this work, I've been really interested in different ways of exploring sort of like displacements in this location. And for me, this continued on different ways around uh, with, with written language. For example, here, this is a title work, Recurring Sun, in which uh, different lines of a poem appear one after the next. Uh, and the work, the, the poem is a six, six word, so a six line poem that plays continuously in a loop. Um, it's actually kind of hard to read in the documentation. So my apologies for that. Um, but in this work, I particularly started getting interested in how language um, works as a video and specifically how it works as a, as a video in certain when it's playing in a, a sort of in a time based installation in which like a viewer enters the work at any point of the, of the text being displayed or which is a kind of an interest, it's an interest specifically, actually more specifically with video and how in the interactions with the work, I started getting interested in, in viewers um, entering at any point of the narrative, um, which to me became kind of a, a, a very recurring thought that I had in my work of uh, uh, always considering so the sense of non nearly, nearly the of linearity not having a beginning or an end. And this continued on to more recent work uh, where I continue to work with uh, this sort of this linear, this sense exploration of linearity or linearity, or at least the clear absence of beginning or end gets a little more explicit in my work. And this piece is titled Reeler. And really, one of the things that becomes really important for me is that there's a kind of narrative arc that happens in the work, but also in the experience of the work. Uh, so at the beginning of the conversation, I was talking about how I'm interested in how certain technologies and objects embody an experience of displacement. And this is kind of what I mean by this. Uh, to me, it isn't entirely about what the text or not just what the text says and whatever the image shows, but also how the work is experienced as, as an installation. I think that I like to create an experience where my viewers are put in a situation where they have to triangulate their relationship um, to the work and also their relationship to the language and their relationship to the story it tells. And it is in that process of triangulation that I, what I refer to as an experience of displacement and an embodied displacement. Uh, 
I'm trying to move on to the next slide. There we go. <laughs> and that has continued on to, to even more recent work. This is a work titled A Rogue Lament, which is a poem um, that is written in the form of Wi Fi network names. And it is accessed specifically only when a user search for Wi Fi networks on a device. So there's a little bit more of this continuation of like sort of an unexpected encounter with a work, but also just a, a position where the person has to run, is put in a, in, a, in a evaluation of like what it is that they're encountering and sort of like further exploring this, this experience of this, of, of, of this placement, like what is going on, why, why is this text here? What is, why am I encountered in, in, in this particular format? And this work really more pointedly explores that because um, the key thing about it is that it's intended to, uh, it works with a battery, so it can be taken anywhere. And it's, I display it primarily in places where people search for Wi Fi networks in like naturally or already, like cafes or bus stations or things like that, where like it, there is already kind of like a process of people going through Wi Fi networks that happens kind of naturally. Um, and um, this is sort of moved on to the more recent body of work that I've, uh, that I've explored, uh, that I've worked on, which is a series of images and, and an exhibition called The Mornings in Rivers. And this, um, this, this series of works um, work a little bit differently in terms of like how I explore this is sense of uh, uh, displacement that I described because one of the underlying methods or one of like the, the, the background ways that I've, or one, of, one, of, one of the underlying themes of this exhibition is that there's actually, there's a, there's a, it works off of this, this, um, what could, you can call that kind of like a, a launching pad of considering memory as something that is, that shifts by each set, by each in each moment of remembering that the process of recalling damages memories, and there is a sort of like a, a, a process of, of intent, like input of energy to try to remember things the way that they are. But in that in that intent and process of trying to work to keep things alive, the things begin to degrade as well, and. The, all the images and text in this exhibition uh, come from uh, or operate from a, a, a point of, of view that is sort of a, a citation process, meaning that they're all taken from um, a, a specific uh, fictional narrative, but the fictional narrative is not um, this close to the viewer. So throughout this in this citation process pe uh, people are getting ex bits and excerpts of a longer story a longer fictional story but also a fictional story that they're not really getting a set, uh, an entire sense of and this is kind of a, a way for me to continue kind of explain the sense of like the viewer having to going through this process of, of triangulation and and and, and sort of situating themselves in relations to, to the work that they're experiencing. So that's the short version of what I, <laughs> that's like a little introduction to what I do. And uh, with having said all of that, um, I'm really, I'm really glad to be here. I, I'm, I'm really curious to get um, started with asking some questions. I'm glad that you had a chance to talk about the photo books because I know that you mentioned that you hadn't really had a chance to talk about them a lot before. Yeah. And I also really appreciated you going a little bit over what the um, what the algorithms that you use, whether mm -hmm. whether they're originally being intended for, for using. Um, yeah. Well, I, I think it's really interesting that we have a lot of themes and ideas that overlap with our practices, but we approach mm -hmm. it very differently. Um, for you, it seems like you engage with the fragmentary nature of, of language or decoding or translating. Um, and you talk about, you, you know, this, the shift 
for the, the viewer into displacement. And in many ways, I think that this work at the AGG um, does something similar. Um, as I am interested in things out of place and enlarging tiny details that can maybe hint towards certain things. But my work is very um, almost completely formless, but you kind of give a hint of what we might be seeing. So that like specific work that you just showed that um, a sunset is a sunrise in reverse. The parenthesis of my day opened against my will to sleep before dawn and would close against my will to sleep after dusk. Even just saying that out loud also leads me to another question about how you title works um, because the titles of my works is very um, important to the, the intention of, of the work and using algorithms, um, but they can also be seen as like fragments of the artwork. Mm -hmm. So it can either help to plant an idea um, or maybe even blur the meaning further. So yeah, what, like what do you, where do you stand? What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm glad that you're bringing that up because I kind of wanted to start talking a little bit about that too because we both kind of use uh, algorithms similarly. And I brought up this, I brought this image with me because this is kind of shows you like the back, the, the skeleton of how my images are made. And there is sort of a, a big underlying part of it is the, the I'm using a tool that, um, where I give a, a, a field, a vector field, these sort of reference points of like color and then the computer using its own algorithm and its own thinking uh, like parameters um, tries to triangulate what the gradient will be like from this point to this point and from this point to this point and so on and so forth. So that's, that's mm -hmm. a little bit how I use uh, the kind of like, I guess like algorithms in my work. Um, but I was also, but I was thinking that for, for you, there's almost like a, in, in the way at least that, that you, you interact with. It's pretty with, restrictive. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it restrictive, but what I would say is that you actually kind of take them kind of literally in a sense too, which right. I think is interesting. And, yeah. and like, in the, in the sense of like nearest neighbor being like, you kind of like, you draw meaning from the name of right. it. And right. you also draw meaning, you almost, you in your paper as well, which I, uh, maybe people, some, some folks in the audience might have had the chance to read, um, you even you give a certain amount of personality mm -hmm. to, to the- Well, uh, I mean, it's interesting. I, I feel like I preach this all the time. I've been thinking about it a lot, about how we, we forget that algorithms and programs like Photoshop are made by human beings. So I kind of have this visual in my head of like a think tank of people sitting around a table and saying, what makes a good image? And um, what should we make the default settings of these like, you know, programs and, and, and um, algorithms as they're building and creating these, these systems. Um, and so I start to think about those specific people and their own, you know, like what they value in a, as a good image or what they value in being a user of the program. And so it, it, it's hard for me to separate those creators' personalities that are just kind of fed into the algorithms. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why when I give a lot of... Um, thoughts and maybe almost think of it in an extreme lin linear way. I, I do that because it allows me to question even like, what do I value in an image mm -hmm. or in artwork? Mm -hmm. And so when, I, when I'm sampling these images and cropping and expanding details at the same time, hiding them or hiding others, it's, it's constantly asking why. Um, and I think this is very specific to digital technology. Although it, it kind of can happen with analog processes, but that's sort of why I think of, yeah, personalities of algorithms and just a conventional use of pr parameters. Yeah, no, that's nice to hear because I was actually, to go back to your question about you were asking me how I title my works. And uh, I, okay, so the way that I title works is, it, it's funny because 
I tend to work with my work because there's a, there's a, there's a huge amount of proximity to personal experience in my work. It's mm. it takes a lot from my, just from like things that I've lived. And one of the ways that I deal with that is that I actually fictionalize a lot of the things that I reference and therefore there's a kind of like an authorial voice or sen like a sense of like, I'm separate from the voice that's right, that's written, mm -hmm. if that mm -hmm. makes sense. And so there's like, it, it, in a way, it's sort of a little bit similar to a, sort of a conventional writing form in mm -hmm. that you, um, there's, a, there's a kind of understanding that the author is not the, the voice, is the character. And what I try to shape and work with is sort of the, is, is like how much of that narrator or speaker mm -hmm. my, my public interacts with. And, but it's nice to hear it, you talk about how um, so much of your um, interest in the algorithms is actually, or like at least the language of the algorithms is very mm -hmm. personal because there's like kind of like, it's, I was wondering if you did a similar process. Like I was wondering if, if like you were like, oh, am I, uh, is it's, it is actual like <clears throat> Meg's interpretation of like, how algorithms Work. like think, or is that kind of right. like a fiction, not like is that a fictionalized person encountering the, um, yeah. the, the algorithms? I, I'm not sure if it's so important that these photographs are situated in, or like that people know that they're from a personal archive because they're not, that's not clear. You don't see, you don't come into the space and think, wow, this is a very personal work. Um, but it, it is because it comes from my own images, but like I could apply this technique to any photographs that I don't have a connection to, but maybe the personal does create for me, like a stronger relationship for me in, in the making of the work. And I think that is important for me to be excited about, about the work that I am doing. Um, but yeah, you're right in that in my thesis paper as a support as a supporting paper for this work, I do share memories and some details about the original photographs um, that these images kind of came from. And I think that's kind of central to photography in that this practice kind of hinges on the transference of, of memory, like oscillating from between like control and chance, but that memory that is created is, um, it's, not a, it's not a moment that is replete, it's, it's formless and it continues um, to evolve over time. And when I talk about this idea of like images are within images, um, you know, it's like this personal archive in a, it's like a time capsule. I don't know if you've ever played this game, but I recently played it with a, some close friends who I haven't seen in a while, actually some friends in Montreal. And it's where you think of a random, very specific date, and then you scroll mm -hmm. through your phone to find that date and then share the photo. Um, and sometimes it's really funny, but then other times it just sparks like a conversation of like, oh, that's what you did on, you know, April 2nd. 2018 you know and you you can like kind of go back and we're often like I mean for me my my google phones go back into like 2008 <laughs> so I, it's yeah. like you forget <clears throat> that you take these photographs um mm -hmm. but yeah so it, it is yeah. hard to take away the personal but I mean how do you mm -hmm. how do you use the personal in in your work well, first of all, that game terrifies me. Like, <laughs> idea of, like, like scrolling through, like, it's showing, but like, I know it's too scary to me. <laughs> I'll play it with myself, and uh, like, I, I'll, I'll be a little self-conscious to do it with someone else. Uh, well, okay, so I'm really happy that you're asking this because um, I was gonna ask you about this as well. So, like, the this because. I'm interested in working with memory as it's experienced subjectively. So for example, um, like in the mornings in reverse, um, 
there th this particular poem uh which was um maybe i'll just quickly read it so i mm. i never read my poetry so it's a, it's a weird thing <laughs> but <laughs> Um, dragged into the present tense, the memory of a paring blade concealed within a folded newspaper is a foreign event. Nobody said that the past turns into plasticine figurines and that one's own hands, when they reach with thirst into the past tense, when they anticipate the familiar edges of shelved memories, dent everything with the weight of each grasp. I fear through my skin's intuition that what I hold in my hands I haven't held before. And then the strangeness of my own past to myself betrays habitual remembrance. I have to forget to remember well. So in this poem, like what, what I'm interested in, what I mean by how memory is experienced subjectively, for me, I'm interested in like in what happens when things are remembered and misremembered and how memories change over time. And that's kind of what I, what I mean by like uh, how retrieving memories damages memories. Um, and, and so like the process of, of, of recalling something blends in a certain amount of fabrication as well, because you kind of miss, fill in the missing gaps. Mm -hmm. but, for, but for you, you have this interest in archives Mm -hmm. And this is interesting for me because archives are inst instinctively less mutable than subjective memory because it's subjective memory is, is tied to a person and a, a, a archive is tied to an actual object. Mm -hmm. And I, I was also thinking that like subjective memory and archives then kind of become like analogs kind mm -hmm. of to like subjective memory is an analog to spoken language and archive mm -hmm. is kind of a, an analog to written language because mm -hmm. one is tied to this one side to a speaker and the other one's tied to an object in posterity and for me one of the things that's interesting about the written language is that the fact that uh, the ability to interpret its meaning is subject to the context in which the reader finds the text right and so there's a kind of fragility to meaning despite the concreteness of the thing and I was mm -hmm. wondering if for you something similar happens with archives like is there a fragile quality to them for you and what is if that makes sense to you like what does that fragility mean to you yeah uh, I think um I think there's something boundless in the analog image and maybe even more with the digital image I think the difference between digital and analog is just really a technological shift. It's not that one is better or that like than the other, but that there's something that happens when they coincide. Um, and so when I think about the, again, with my, when I think about the fragmentary nature of my work, like a glitch on a photograph or a sample of an image or the shimmer, like what we're seeing right now of the line of glass beads to me kind of function as an interruption. So this interruption is perhaps a, it's the, the interruption between digital and analog, or maybe it's just an interruption of thought, um, like thought of, of, um, of memory, but kind of what you're saying, and I know we've talked about it before, but it's that book called The Gestures of Writing and Lines and Surfaces by um, Vilem Flusser, mm -hmm. right? The Gesture of Writing. And he basically, a, if this is a, it a yeah. Yeah, it, it yes. provides an, an analysis of our understanding of the world that is constructed through basically two forms. Um, writing and images, which might, like one might consider um, fundamental turning points in the human culture. And he kind of talks about how images are abstractions of reality, which I, I agree with. And I think it's really hard to separate the question of abstraction when talking about photographs. But there's a quote here, and I think it's related. It said, he says, if we lose our ability to decode the images, our lives will instead become a function of images. And our, our imagination instead turns into a form of hallucination. Mm. And I don't know, it kind of has this play on, on memory to me. And mm. just how like uh, images are just filled with like one image can be filled with um, a multitude of, of memories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 
yeah I guess like that's kind of a, that's it's kind of like about what I was wondering if you could elaborate on and thanks thanks for doing so because I I do find that um that there's a kind that, that even though you're you're working with these with these archives of images there's a kind of like mutability to to the archive that you work with mm -hmm. uh, that I that I appreciate a lot because there's a sort of um you know there's a very subject still a very kind of subjective interaction with with the thing itself and i find it i think that i find that kind of interesting because to me kind of like one of the interesting things about working with memory was or is um how it works like more like within like someone's head um mm -hmm. but for I, I, it's nice to see you kind of interact interacting with how that applies to how you interact with Mm -hmm. the actual physical uh, or with the actual archive, I guess. Right. Well, I um, think, it, I mean, a big part of my research over the course of my MFA was about thinking about language and how it can be tactile and fragile. And although it's not extremely present in here, in this environment, you know, where I'm behind me, it was the starting point of the work. And I think when I think about... Um, I guess like we mentioned a little bit about my the thesis and I had a really great time uh, writing that because essentially I had to write a thesis paper about photographs and it just made sense that I used language like I kind of it was a requirement but it also I got really into describing and and talking about the memory and like being really personal about sharing um, what the, the original photograph Kind of meant to me um but then when you kind of mix it with this like that text doesn't exist in this space um maybe it should maybe maybe the the two don't like to, like go hand in hand um but i think the way that i was thinking about language was this like thinking about the fragility of it and the, it's hard to not think about poets because they actively disrupt words and sentences and thrive off the notion that language is fragile and they make something beautiful. And I think I, I see this work as like a, a giant poem, like a poem without words. Um, and you, you've used um, a lot of images and text in your work. And I wonder if you thought about that exploration of language that might be separate from images. Um, you know, I think for me, like in this work, there is a play with language um, because of the titles, because I, I, I use a broken system of the word, like a very like basic generator to create a written description of, of the words. Um, mm -hmm. But some people like quite honestly might miss that until they go home mm -hmm. and maybe like look at the brochure if they take it and then notice these weird titles. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there might be a separate experience with the viewers, um, like viewing the images and reading the text that is associated mm -hmm. with the images. So I'm kind of curious how, what your thoughts are on, on the play between image and text. Mm -hmm. um, well, for me, the, yeah, it's, Yeah, it's it's funny because I, for me, like just thinking, there is kind of a separation between yes, what, what like what the text is and how it operates as an image, and mm, you know, it like I try to make it so that like in in and when 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 folks interact with with language in in my work and I in my work and I think you do the same but you do it differently is is I, I try the 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 text to kind of make sense in how and in, in how out of place it is mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah so like I one of the reasons why I like like working with the language, written language is that it, the fact that it is not inside of a textbook uh, or in book 
or whatever, or a conventional reading place where somebody would experience like written like literature, written art, poetry, is that then the con the meaning of the text makes sense in the context that it's encountered. So it kind of gives it a bit of a site specificity. And so it, it kind of ties the language to the object and to the place where it's experienced. And I try to do that in, in, in my work. And I think that kind of happens also with the, the way that you title your work because it's mm -hmm. a kind of suddenly because it's so removed from its context, it kind of leaves the viewer at a, in a place of like wondering of like what 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 is it, what's its origin and there's a kind of a, a similar kind of experience of displacement of like okay like well there's there's something that's not working here <clears throat> so that's kind of how I view that um, and but it's it's funny that you're talking about your your paper and because I I also find it that you're in your in your writing you're really 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 generous and uh, mm. like really talking about about how much like you talk about you talk about everything I know exactly how your works were made like I know for, <laughs> like I know precisely like every bit of like process that went into them and I kind of appreciate that to be honest because I, I put up photo here of like in this work like I just I really like seeing what I, I really like showing a, a little bit of like how things, like what 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 are the steps, what are like what are what are the things, and how like, not. There's something interesting to me about that that I yeah. sometimes have difficulties articulating, and I was wondering maybe what it like what it what meaning is there for you to like be so like transparent yeah. I mean, in the process. Yeah, I mean, artists take keep secrets all the time. Although we don't really say secrets, we just rather speak in a secret code um, that only insiders will understand. They're, one of my favorite writers in art, um, Amy Silman, kind of writes about this in her essay on color. Um, but revealing my secrets and sharing step-by-step -step processes of how I create what I create, I think just allows for every detail to be present and talked about. You know, we can talk about the memories mm -hmm. of the photographs. We can conceptualize about the tools that were used to create the photographs. We can discuss the fact that making art can happen outside of the studio and outside of the making. And I think that, um, I don't know how this will land, but I think that secrets can reveal what we value. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I mean, and again, like it's not present in the space. It's really, in, in, when you read the text or like the paper and then you're in the space and you see it um so like maybe my work should exist in like a photo book where you kind of have all of you know all of it um because i do struggle with like using like share like ha having all that information and the the i guess what you said like generosity in the way that i wrote about this work for the paper how that can be present in the space um that's something I haven't really like figured out yet because I really, I do enjoy sharing that and I enjoy writing um, just how they kind of coincide in the same space. I, I find that really difficult. You obviously don't, you do it really well. <laughs> <laughs> that's really nice of you. <laughs> no, but it's funny because I, I really, um, I don't know. I, I like the way that you describe it. The, there is meaning in what it's in, there's meaning in the details and I guess there's meaning in the, in the secrets in the sense of like, there's meaning for you. It, like there's like, a, you kind of show what it is that matters to you in the process when you share those things. And mm -hmm. I find it really difficult to sometimes not talk about process in my work sometimes because like, I, I really think, I, I think similarly to you. Um, but I sometimes just want to bombard everyone with like very <laughs> minutia. <laughs> uh, because like, uh, but I think for you that that description is a really it's really I, I think it adds a, a layer of like I said generosity that kind of you know for a, a, a body of work that could easily read and and 
on first glance as like that there's not a lot of the artists present because of, there's so much process. There's a lot of, of you in those processes and in those decisions. And that to me right. that is where I started getting is where I started getting really interesting. Mm -hmm. where, where I can kind of see and, and peek in through the details of like where where you mm -hmm. are in the work. I also have something to add. I might say that it's it feels maybe the same gesture of writing a diary. Because for me, like, I'm starting to lose um, the original details of that photograph because they're just becoming their own images themselves, um, separate from where they came from. And so for, like the photo crop kind of enhances those details that can trigger a memory of the day that, the the, that I took the photograph. But now I might be mistaken and it, you know, in fact, it's not the same memory that's attached to the photo that I initially took, but it still mm -hmm. has this capacity to generate um, like a deep emotional response. And mm -hmm. it kind of shifts something else. Like now looking back at these images, it'll be very different than where they originally came from for me. And I think that's what happens when you start to stretch the photograph. Like for example, in this one, it's hard to see in the documentation. So I think the scale and the, the types of photo papers that I'm using, you can see where the, there's a point where the pixels start to have edges and the image becomes formless um, mm -hmm. and the color kind of absorbs or, or like bathes the space in light. Um, so it just becomes this other thing. But I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think that I still believe that there's images within images. Um, it, it just doesn't have to be the like correct one. Like, I don't, who cares? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, but like, do you, do you think that an image can exist as, uh, as like a single entity or do you agree that there's images within images? What mm. are your thoughts? Well, I mean, to me it's always, um, you know, in terms of, uh, an image, you know, I tend to kind of like put text and image in the same category of of, uh, of thing <laughs> in terms of uh, there's an interpretive process that happens between uh, between interpretive process that happens in the viewer when in, where we're interacting with it, and that kind of mutability to me is interesting, uh, and and I, and I guess that's kind of the as far as I would go in terms of like considering an image within an image or like. If I'm interpreting it the way that you're explaining it correctly, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, in fact, sorry that this actually that, that now that I'm talking about this, I'm thinking maybe this is actually an interesting segue into the last little bit of uh, that I wanted to talk to you before opening into questions. I'm just keeping an eye on, on time, um, and maybe this is a prompt for folks if anyone. <clears throat> has any questions that they want to start preparing uh, mm -hmm. now it's the time but before opening it up uh, this particular image um i asked you to share with me because mm -hmm. uh i wanted what one of the comments that came into your in your that uh, one of the comments that was said in your defense i believe it was susan Dobson who brought it up or uh, it was a question i thought it was a really good question which was uh this question of like whether you saw that the viewer as an algorithm in the terms of like try, you ask them are you putting us in a position of like having to interpret these mm -hmm. images and um i i did a funny little exercise uh uh sharing this image to people who've never seen your your oh. your your work uh and asked them to tell me what they thought it was um, so I'll give you the quick list of it. Okay. <clears throat> and I asked, I also asked them for the level of certainty uh, around, <laughs> around their description. So the first one, the first, the first one blew my mind. One person said it's a corrupted pixel, and oh they're my gosh. uncertain, which is kind of mind blowing. Uh, like, <laughs> okay, cool. That's pretty close. Um, yeah. A smog, smog sky in Beijing, medium certainty zoomed in skin uncertain section of the sky at sunset medium certainty and skin under the light high certainty so that's amazing there you go so i that's think that's it. my next project <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh 
Yeah, well, in, in that note, I, <laughs> I should I'm open, open it. I'm gonna open it up, and uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Nicole's uh, question here. So, <clears throat> my question relates, and sorry for anybody that that um, wants to see the questions in the chat. It's in the chat right now. So, my question relates to audience reception slash connection. I'm struck by how you're both deploying. You both deploy a chance in your work by leaving some of the generative process to up to algorithms and the like. I noted that Meg, you talked about the work being deceptive in a way. Jose Andres, you mentioned this idea of fictionalizing the, the language in the work. Hmm. With leaving room for uncertainty, have you ever been surprised by the way that your audience responds to your, your work? Have there ever been chance encounters in interactions with audiences? How do you feel about that? Um, I love hearing, like what you just mentioned, I love hearing people respond in um, however, whatever they see. And I think that um, this kind of work really does welcome all these different interpretations um, of, of different readings. Um, I'm just trying to like reread it. Um, yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna respond? I don't know. Yeah, well, in terms of like, say. yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and in terms of um, the sort of incorporation, this incorporation of chance to me, it's pretty important in my work in the sense that, uh, kind of like generally speaking, I tend to try to approach working with technology with a certain amount of, um, latitude in terms of in what, I, what I mean by that is there is um, something more interesting to letting things, letting the system operate in a way that you might not find it predictable. Mm. Um, especially because I mean, especially when one works with technology, one tends to sort of interpret the interaction between user and technology as being one of control of like, you know, you yield the technology to, to give you a result. And to me, me working with technology in general becomes more, or processes actually, even not just technology, but like a, even a rigid process becomes more interesting when that, um, where, where the result becomes open-ended because it, then you have room for interpreting um, and for working with what happened through chance rather than setting out to work to get a specific result, right? So mm -hmm. that's, good. that's kind of how I feel about that. Is there anything else you wanted to add, uh, Nick? No, I guess when I think about chance in relation to photography, almost everything has the potential to be interfered with and change the outcome of an image. So the uninfected and the affected kind of adds to the sense of, um, like photography's lucidity. And um, that's why it can, for me, it's really exciting. Um, but yeah. Um, Nestor Kruger asks, my apologies if this is too obvious, but I am interested to hear what attracts the two of you to the gradient. Mm. And I'm gonna let you go for that first, if you want. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, um, I guess the because the work has no lines or edges um, and that they're just these flat gradients of color, some more broken than others, the curation of um, photographs that I choose for the that I chose for the final exhibition was purely a discussion based on this question of the gradient or based on color. So for me, um, during the process, I kind of had a limited control of what samples I was finding in my archive. And it's simple to describe something like this, that you're seeing this yellow or orange or light colors in the work, because those are typically colors of light. And mm -hmm. when searching for these moments of error, light leaks are the easiest to spot. Um, and there usually is kind of a gradient. It's where the, the film negative is being stretched and light kind of seeps into the emotion and it, it it has this different gradients of intensities um 
but other colors kind of come from chemistry failures in the analog processes. And of course, there's like a black one that is almost absent or complete absorption of like visible light. So gradient to me um, in this environment kind of suggests an atmosphere of something that um, that that's uh, oh, it's so hard not to like use the word beautiful, <laughs> but there is <laughs> there is something that I'm like obviously like interested in the way that they look um but it could be like it's hard to pinpoint what that gradient is so something is like either really out of focus or it's something like what your friend had mentioned of seeing sunsets or seeing a sky um that there's a tip like a a very simple gradient in nature that we see especially when we take you know with smartphones it kind of like amplifies that um yeah. so i like the gradient <laughs> um, <laughs> and i'm actually i'm kind of curious to see like what this photo would look like versus doing a gradient on like painting a gradient through photoshop and seeing the differences or mm -hmm. or if there is any because again those algorithms and generators would come come into play and maybe it would create an identical or something close. Um, um, what are your thoughts on the gradient? Um, well, Nestor, I think that question is too obvious. Sorry, I'm not going to answer. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I, I'm only saying this because I know Nestor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I began working with, with, with gradients. Um, I'm going to go back to the my images of the very beginning. Um, the first images that I started working with were these text-based ones, and I was originally trying to. Um, I kind of work. I started working as a bit of a, um, a very simple exercise of trying to make a piece of paper look like it had been exposed to sight to light damage. So now I kind of just funny. I, I never make the connection. It's, it's similar to you in that sense. Mm -hmm. Only that I was working trying to do a facsimile of of damage by sunlight. And so when I, that's kind of what started catalyzing my use <clears throat> or what catalyzed my use uh, of gradients to begin with. Um, similar to you, there's, a, there's obviously a, an, an aesthetic interest, uh, but for when I started working on specifically and trying to do the facsimile uh, or the simulation of degradation of color, I was, um, part of me was also just Mm, trying to uh, reproduce or emulate the the process of um, how color fades or what stages um, of of decay happen when um, a particular ink or a particular color is exposed to sunlight, and I was trying to do this to kind of create to create prints that were a um, sort of an arresting of time in between a state of, of um, falling apart and a state of being of, of how they were printed originally. And I, I was trying to use the this sort of very archival method of printing as a way to really kind of like you know, get it stuck in time mm -hmm. by using by using um, the sort of very, very arch archival um, uh, photo inject process. Um, but naturally, as, as I worked with the tool more, um, I started noticing what things it did, um, despite my will. And mm -hmm. um, I started to use um, the, the sort of a like gradient composite process to create simulations of an image out of focus. Mm -hmm. And there is something that you were talking about in your appreciation of the gradient that I think you and I also both share, which is how there's a sort of like moment of uncertainty of like deciphering what something is. Um, and that is really, that, that's really what really, if like, it, if I started with like the catalyst of it was like working, like to make the simulations when I noticed 
that this was happening and the uncertainty of interpretation, that's really what propelled me to continue working on it was when I started noticing that um, it was possible to create these amb ambiguous representations of, um, of, uh, of a scene or, or, or a place and that there was also not just an ambiguity to the represented object or, or scene, but also an ambiguity of to what, who, how the image is constructed as well. Um, and so that the great, like working with a gradient and this, uh, with this particular process, that's really what I, I latched on to continue working on. Mm -hmm. What took the reason I continued working on, uh, on these images was pretty much that. And the other thing that just, this is just like a really basic thing is I really enjoy not working. I, I was working with vectors and, but I wasn't working with any hard lines and the only lines that were being formed or suggestions of lines where it's by like literally putting two gradients near each other right. and so in there was something really fun about that because i used to paint like a million years ago and I, it was just kind of fun to work with mm -hmm. <laughs> um i have a question here by andrew uh thank you both so much for your generosity and work thank you uh i'm wondering if you could discuss the dream space to exhibit these works. There are so many possibilities for audience encounters with these works, as billboards, billboards, sorry, as relation exchanges, as books, et cetera. Just curious how you imagine these works ex existing outside of the gallery. And Meg is gone. <laughs> well, I wanted to uh, grab one of these books. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is why I left. Um, I totally see these existing outside of the gallery, and because I want people to interact with them, and I, I think of these as books, I am curious how they would travel as books. Like put them through, um, like book slots, or you know, people carrying them in their tote bags, and you know, this like travel, and how that would change the. Um, kind of quality and like, you know, how like a book is really lo well loved and it kind of has these like, like a broken spine or like, you know, frayed edges. I feel like that's what would happen to these photographs on the MDF. Um, so that I, I can see existing. It's harder to situate these like extreme um, flat aluminum, prints uh, that's not on a wall <laughs> um but also there is kind of the something could be interesting if it it wasn't in a controlled environment because nothing's protecting the photographs it's just the the prints so they easily get damaged um and uh yeah i mean it's it, it would be a full circle i guess because the photographs come from moments of error. Um, so if something kind of disrupted that, it, it would make sense. Um, mm -hmm. But for your, your question, Andrew, I think it's these things that um, I would like to see in backpacks and tote bags and um, yeah, I would like to see it outside the gallery. Yeah, in terms of for my work, um, there is a, sorry, I'm like trying to go forward to my the images in the show here. There, one of the things that I, I was very excited about for these particular images was um, the, the, the control over like the, how people related to them in terms of the, the relationship people's no, and the work and and the images as well. A lot of the prints are fairly big. Um, I believe well, the biggest one is this one's fifty by fifty, um, and the other ones vary obviously. Um, but anyway, there's like I, there's a there's a my intention was to kind of like have the images meet the viewers like at a, at a with a fairly sizable um, uh, scale, and 
that may not necessarily be something that happens in a gallery only. It's easier to do in a gallery space. Um, I, and uh, hmm, for those images in particular, I, I, I really, I can envision them existing in other forms as well, but the main, the main um, parameter would have to be something that's where people are, are still able to encounter them kind of at an eye level. Mm -hmm. And that could be in a variety of different situations, not necessarily at a gallery space, but that kind of like closeness to the works is important to me, at least for now. Um, in terms of the um, other, I mean, this work is intended to roam around. Um, right, of course. You know, just wherever it shows up, it shows up. Um, and uh, Reeler has always been also very similar in terms of the, the kind of relationship to, <clears throat> to body and work that I have. It, it's, it's intended to kind of like meet you at a, at a, at a very kind of like visceral level. Um, so in short answer to, to the questions, like it's, it, as, as long as like, that is like the most important parameter for me, um, not so much the, the venue, but definitely the, the one-to-one -one kind of relationship is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for those questions. Yeah, thank you. And, um, yeah, I don't see any more questions in the chat. I know we've been keeping people for a bit of a time. We're heading into an hour and a half. Yeah. That's what happens when you put two people who ramble together. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so maybe I'll open it up to uh, uh, Nicole once again, and I'll stop sharing. Well, I just want to take a, a really brief moment to thank um, both of you, Meg and Jose Andres, uh, for um, sharing with us this experience of a dialogue between artists in the studio, um, between colleagues, between friends. Uh, you're both so generous uh, in the way that you share your practice with all of us who have joined the conversation today, but even as you say, um, I'm really struck by how you're keen on sharing your practice and, and your process with uh, viewers as they stop by the gallery to see your, your work as it were. Um, so uh, on that note, if you are joining us from somewhere that is close to Guelph, uh, Nearest Neighbor is up until June 19th, and I strongly encourage you to stop by. I don't think I need to tell anyone that uh, it's very much a different experience um, uh, having the chance to be bathed in the light of those gradient colors as you described it so aptly, Meg. Um, and I also wanted to just mention that uh, later this month, we have another uh, exhibition coming up by uh, MFA uh, student Rehab Essay, um, whose exhibition is uh, I Dream of a Soft Oasis, and this opens on June 29th. We are so um, grateful for our partnership with the School of Fine Art and Music at the University of Guelph that gives us an opportunity to connect with um, students uh, to show their work. And so uh, um, we're really thankful for that partnership uh, that brings exhibitions like this uh, to the gallery. Um, I also thought I'd mention quickly that we have another online conversation coming up between uh, artist Gail Uyagaki Kabluna and curator Takarlik Partridge, who um, the, the exhibition they worked on together um, is also up at the Art Gallery of Guelph. And that talk is happening on June 14th. Um, so I invite all of you to join us for that. Um, of course, I need to thank our funders, the Ontario Arts Council and the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, not, last but not least, uh, um, my sincere thanks for everyone who joined us today and for your questions. Uh, I must thank um, Meg and Jose Andreas again. Thank you so much for sharing this conversation with us today. Thank you for giving us the space to do thank it. Thank you so much. Yeah, Absolutely. Awesome.